and we're live on book chat live and this week we have the amazing michael j mcmahon is it j mcmahon or is it michael mcmahon I'm forgot well, it's, like, it's a bit of both really i mean i have a i have an author page on amazon because i write myself and yeah. there i go by michael j mcmahon yes so j is just my middle initial that's all okay yeah well i mean i'm i wrote my first fiction books is timothy michael lewis so i can't really criticize you for, for doing that i've got a non-fiction book under the name tim lewis but there's about 15 other people with the name tim lewis so i was okay. just checking i hadn't missed out a j by accident in some no no you didn't no you didn't that's fine okay well can you you're you're an author of quite a few books i think so can you briefly describe what sort of books you write and, and well, also by generally what sort of books you like to read well, um, the, the books that I write, uh, uh, I haven't got that many out. I, mean, I think I've published four um, yeah. and I'm working on a fifth and sixth now. Um, and they're a bit of an oddball mixture. They're all nonfiction, Tim. Um, the first one was a was is a book about personal finance and it's called Back to the Black. And it's about and the subtitle is How to Become Debt Free and Stay That Way. And it's based on an actual experience that I had of a major financial crisis about 20 years ago. And it's basically what I learned from from that crisis and, and managing it. So that, that's what that book is about. Um, and, uh, and then I wrote a, a totally different book, which is called The Wedding Speech Handbook, based on the fact that I am a coach and I coach wedding speakers and I've trained a lot of public speaking uh, of people in public speaking uh, in a professional situation who had to who had to speak for their job or as part of their job and then suddenly realized that actually uh, weddings are the most stressful time of all to yeah. speak at. so I wrote that book and that that's done quite well I mean of, of, of my books that's the probably the most popular um, and then in the last couple of years I published a couple of books which are based on my love of epigrams quotations aphorisms call them what you will um things that say a lot in that, that say a lot in a short number of words and a, a, a small number of words so uh, as john lynch who wrote the foreword for that book uh, uh describes it multum in parvo so you see he's obviously a very educated bloke he mm -hmm. says a lot in just a little so those are my books i so i uh, I, and I coach wedding speakers, as I mentioned, and that's me. What kinds of books do I like to read? Well, as we'll see in this program, there's quite a wide variety. I do read a lot of nonfiction, and like most blokes, I mean, for a long time, I wrote, I read only nonfiction. Yeah. But I then came came to the conclusion that really um, I was missing such a lot by not not just enjoying myself reading fiction as well. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, well, I think it's about 50 50 fiction, non fiction. Which okay. Is okay. So, yeah. It's like, well, I'm looking down the list. I think it's mostly, I think it's about 50 50. Anyway, should we start with the first book? Yes. The Zone of Interest by Martin Amis. So, why this book? Well, Martin, I've got to say, uh, until I read this book, I hadn't been a big Martin Amis fan. I had been a fan of his dad, Kingsley Amis, because he's funny. Um, yeah. Martin Amis, uh, a brilliant writer, but I just didn't, I didn't get him some. I read, I read several of his novels, but then came across this one and I read it and it absolutely knocked me sideways. Um, it's a book about Auschwitz, Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, but it never, it doesn't say Auschwitz and it's, yeah. so it's slightly fictionalized. So um, it's, and it's caught, the title is based on the fact that the whole area around Auschwitz uh, was called by the Nazis, the zone of interest. Um, and it's been made into a film recently with the same title and the zone of interest included Auschwitz and Birkenau and also the compound where the commandant lived. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and the film is based entire, almost entirely on the life of the commandant and his family, almost ignoring what was going on behind the, the walls and the barbed wire. But the th what this book did for me was it absolutely knocked me sideways it's it's written from three 
point of view, and it sort of alternates chapter by chapter, the three different points of view. So there's a, a commandant of this fictional uh, concentration camp, which we know pretty sh for sure is Auschwitz. There's, so there's a commandant, then it alternates with a, uh, not a, not a normal prisoner, but a trustee. You know, they, you know, they would always have these, uh, so there was a word for them, which I've forgotten now. And these were prisoners which were used as trustees to try and keep the other prisoners in, in order, etc. And the third one was a civilian. A civilian yeah. whom I think uh, from now I, I read this book several years ago, um, so I haven't got it uh, off by heart. Um, and this civilian, I think, worked for uh, a chemical company, IG Farben, which was yeah. the company that basically made the cyanide. Well, um, but th what I remember is I finished this book and uh, yes, it's fictionalized, but thinly fictionalized. When I finished it, I just sat there in total silence, Tim. Something I haven't done for a long time. I thought, oh my God, that it was just, mm -hmm. uh, it was shattering the effect on me. Uh, and and the f and the fact it was fictionalized meant, uh, and probably that reminded me uh, something I needed to be reminded of, which was the power of fiction, which is that you can you can be so taken with the characters in the book and you've identified with them, et cetera, et cetera, that it, it had more an effect on me than it, than than a non-fiction his work of history about yeah. about the Holocaust would have done. Yeah, I mean, are they they called sub commanders or sub sub commanders, some German version of sub commander of the people. Yes, do you know what? I'm not. My memory is usually pretty good, but it's it, it's. It, it, Maybe in about 45 minutes, he'll come back to me. <laughs> it's always like, oh, yeah, that thing we were talking about. Anyway, yes. Yes. Um, so it sounds like um, it sounds like when people were watching Schindler's List and they came out of that film yes. with a similar sort of like experience, you're right. Making it fictionalised makes it uh, more emotive in a way, doesn't it? Like it's a bit it does. And you know what? You've reminded me of something. Martin Amis himself... Once said, the truth is in the fiction. Now yeah. that's kind of a strange thing to say, but more and more I realise it. And there's a couple of examples um, in the books I'm going to talk about uh, uh, from now on. Um, yeah, the the truth is in the fiction. Somehow, uh, when you're reading fiction, you get behind what the opinion of that author. Mm. was and is more than if they'd written a book of non-fiction and that's that that's a statement that was put rather well by a blogger who i absolutely recommend to you called richard smith uh, richard smith um is the retired former editor of the british medical journal and he he writes a blog daily he is a prolific blogger and he reads very very widely all the time and writes critiques of the books and quotes from them. And he said something very clearly. He talked about, you know, the, the, in, in fiction, you get behind the, the opinion and the, and the, if you like, the soul of the author. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, shall we go on to the next book, which oh, is yeah. another fiction one? A Murder of Quality by Jean Le Carré. So. Well. Um, I I think I've read pretty well all of John Le Carre's stuff, yeah. and I've seen uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, the two versions, the BBC one with with um, uh, <laughs> as, as mm, brains gone. Did I say I had a good memory? I did until five minutes ago, um, <laughs> and uh, and the more recent one, basically with Gary Oldman, um, yeah. And Alec Guinness was obviously in the in the BBC one. Uh, seen those, and I've seen uh, uh, Smiley's People and several others. Read read almost all the novels, and then I came across this very early John Le Carre, A Murder of Quality. And here's the thing: it's about a murder that takes place. It's totally fictional. Totally th takes place in a fictional public school in Dorset. That so Dorset really does exist, <laughs> but the school doesn't yeah. exist. Um, and the and it's it's a slim book actually it's far slimmer than any of his books it, it was probably I think it was his second ever novel but here's the thing I happen to know that John Le Carre was a master at Eton College oh. um, and and uh, you probably know John Le Carre isn't really his name it was a pseudonym yeah 
one. And apparently the boys at Eton College gave him that one because carré means square, doesn't it? And and <laughs> they thought he was a square. And so they, <laughs> they gave him yeah. this nickname of le carré. And so he quite liked that. So anyway, so I thought, well, that's interesting because it's natural enough that he would write a novel based on the murder in a public school because he taught at maybe at certainly the most famous public school uh, in in this country. You know the sort of you know the prep school for the for the cabinet, you might say. Yeah. Um, and and so I thought that's very interesting. Now um, it's natural because everyone says write what you know, and so obviously he knew more about what happens in independent schools and. This, this school clearly was in the top echelon of schools and they were quite snobbish about other schools that weren't quite up to their level. But then when I read the footnote or the footnote or the epilogue, whatever it is, I absolutely discovered there, uh, if it wasn't clear in the book already, what John le Carre thought about the, the downside of our independent school sector. Yeah. And... Um, uh, and it, 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 it it's called an, an afterward. You know, a lot of a lot of books have a have a forward, don't they? And yeah. mine do too. Um, and this book has an afterward. And uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it's uh, and he he doesn't pull his punches basically about saying uh, that he thinks, although actually he made his living as a master at Eton College, saying that he thinks that uh, uh, the public school sector is not. Not a force for good, shall we say. Yeah. So the reason you pick this over his other books is because it's interesting and you also get his political opinions about... Yes, yes, right. exactly. And um, and it, as I said, it was one of his first books. I don't yeah. think people put... I don't think it was that popular, but I just happened to notice and I thought, oh, I don't think yeah. I've read that one. And it, it is beautifully written. And of course, all his books are... And this one is slim, so in a way, you the the quality is is con, condensed in maybe yeah. well fewer than one hundred and fifty pages. Here we are, one hundred and sixty yeah. pages. Yeah, I don't think I've actually read any of the books. I've obviously seen TV adaptions of loads of them, so mm. maybe I'll start with this one. The novels are first class; they all are. Yeah. yeah. Right. Let's go on to the next book. Nice work by David Lodge. Well, um, that one, um, I happen to be living in Birmingham now in Edgbaston, which is a, a suburb of Birmingham just on the west side. And very close to here is another suburb, although I'm sure they wouldn't want it to be called a suburb, <laughs> called Harborn. And David Lodge um, lived there uh, until fairly recently. I mean, he, 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 he's alive at the moment, but, I, but I'm pretty sure he's in retirement home at the moment. Uh, and uh, and, I, and I've, I've been to his house, I've seen his house. And what I like about this is, I mean, he, he, he writes, you, I guess you could call them comic novels, uh, yeah. and very well known around this area as a novelist. And this one is based on um, an academic. A lot of his books are based on a fictional university, which is obviously based on Birmingham University, um, because Birmingham University is located in this area, Edgbaston, yeah. where I live, and Harborn, where he lived. Um, and this fictional university he calls Rummage, ru <laughs> whereas, you know, as you know, the, the, the nickname for Birmingham is Brummagem, and no. uh, yeah. for short. Uh, and I like this very much because it's about this academic um, and uh, and uh, and she, for some reason, decides she wants to uh, do a shadowing job on a local managing director, managing director of a manufacturing company or engineering company, yeah. you know, kind of rough diamond type. And this academic decides she wants to do a shadowing, shadowing job on, on him. So it's a very... I'd say well-drawn um, description of the two worlds they live in, really, and the and the interaction between them. What I liked very much was, by the way, and I mentioned to you that I that I published a couple of books of quotations, epigrams, because I love that sort of thing. Well, each section of this book, um, he begins. David Lodge begins with a quotation. And it could oh, be yeah. from 
it, it, sometimes it's from the Brontes or something. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and, and the, the quotations are great, and they really and they really draw you in to the story that's about to come. And one's from here's one from Elizabeth Gaskell, one's from Dickens. Uh, I think there's one from one of the Brontes, and. I, I really like the, the fact that he'd done that because I'm a bit of a sucker for that sort of thing as well. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, David Lodge. So I'm, I, I'm a fan, basically. Oh, yeah, here we are. The, yeah, the, the first chapter has got a, a quote. And I, the quote is brilliant. And it says this. It says, if you think that anything like a romance is preparing for you, reader, you were never more mistaken. Do you anticipate sentiment and poetry and reverie? Do you expect passion and stimulus and melodrama? Calm your expectations. Reduce them to a lowly standard. Something real, cool and solid lies before you. Something unromantic as Monday morning, when all who have work wake with the consciousness that they must rise and betake themselves thereto. And <laughs> that's a quote from a Charlotte Bronte novel. And... It, it, and it's it summarizes i suppose that prepares you for the for the for the world you're going to enter first of all which is the world of this managing director of a, of a fairly basic engineering company in uh, birmingham yeah i should probably preface the show with that quote shouldn't i so people, yeah. people are aware that it might be boring at times yes, right. exactly. that's right yeah don't don't complain if you find it boring stick with it is what you say yeah well exactly um so it's uh, it's not a graphic novel or anything. It's just a novel. No, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. Let's go the, on to the, the New York one. Times. The New York Times. You know what they're talking about. Yeah. Said on the front page, a funny, intelligent, and superbly superbly paced social comedy. So it's a social comedy. That's what it is. Oh, okay. Right. On to the next book. <laughs> Earthly Remains by Donna Leon. I have only recently discovered Donna Leon, um, and she is uh, an author who writes a, a series, who has written a series of books, all set in Venice. Um, and uh, it's got an ongoing cast of characters. The chief one is which is a commissioner of police in Venice who is investigating murders and what have you um, in Venice. And because I love Venice and it's one of my favorite places in the world and I've been there lots of times although not for a few years now uh, uh, when I first picked one of these books up I thought oh this will be interesting um, and bless her in every book or almost every book there is a map of Venice inside the front cover and oh, that's great oh, okay. because when he's going through the city walking through the city and he's mostly walking because there are no cars in Venice, or he's getting it a water tap, a vaporetto, or yeah. he's getting a police launch, take him somewhere. He'll mention places, and I'll think to myself, Ah, I want, oh, have I been there? Yes, I think I've been there. I want now, whereabouts is that in the and so I, I turn to the map, and that's great because uh, when a book uh, is trying to draw you in, which uh, Donna Leon's books do very well, um seeing seeing the, the the setting on a map it makes it more real to me i thought it was terrific yeah. and for you know, give you another example i was in a cafe the other day and they they had a, a bookshelf there or you know take a book and leave one this kind of thing and i happened to notice one by peter james i don't know if you ever come across him he writes thrillers and most of them are set in brighton which is a oh, place right. i used to yeah. live and i like brighton very much and yeah. uh, he's his, his thrillers always feature a detective inspector called Grace, somebody Grace, and um, and, and, and they're really rather good. And, and and I happened to see this in in this cafe, and I didn't really want to read a, a great a, a Peter James novel at that time, but I picked it up anyway. And sure enough, inside the front cover, there's a map of Brighton, and yeah. then another map of the Brighton area. And I thought, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah, because he's drawing you in. Yeah. It seems to be the last couple of books have had an element of places you've lived, the authors lived. Places, I, like, places I like and, and yes, yeah. I've never lived in Venice, but I wouldn't mind, wouldn't mind yeah, for I a was, year or two. I was actually in Venice in February, so I Were you? the first time I've been to Venice. And uh, yeah, it's a lovely, though I actually, I stayed in um, 
what's it called, Mestra on the mainland. Yes, I know. The yes, train yes. commuting in because it was so much cheaper staying. Oh, in, oh yes. Then it's just very, very expensive. It is. So you've got to accept that. I mean, one of my brothers lives in Canada and he and his partner are going to uh, Italy for a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, he asked me, you know, where I, where would I recommend in Venice? And I said, oh, my God, there's just too many. What, what are your top three things? And I thought, oh, mm. God, does it have to be three? And I, and I told him, listen, Venice is expensive, but you've got to go to the most expensive cafe in Venice, which is in St. Mark's Square, and it call, it's called Florian's because it's just a unique place. Uh, and so, yeah, you can't, you can't get away from the fact that Venice is, is one of the most popular tourist spots on the planet, and yeah. it's very small. And um, they've got to make some money because, you know, anyway, they, they have and they've got to make some money <laughs> and then it's expensive. So it's very sensible on your on your part. And you just got to zip across the mole, mole or whatever they call it to get there every day. So that's fine. Yeah. Well, the train goes goes in and then there's a water. You can't. I, I, first day I walked all the way to the Mark Square, which took ages. Yes. Um, but then the next day I found there was a water taxi that went from their station all the way to Mark Square in about. Yes. 10 minutes so it was kind of like oh okay that would have been a lot easier so well you know I, I i said that i'm i'm a sucker for quotes and before i went to the venice the first time i went there for my honeymoon but before that i went with a friend of mine um and and i got a book uh, a guidebook called venice for pleasure which i don't think i put in my list but it's no, my favorite guidebook of all time and uh Oh, yeah. No, actually, you did. You did. Put I did. It. Okay, well, when we come to it, I'll tell you what I like about that book. Yeah, and we um, before we end up turning into the We Love Venice podcast, I suppose. <laughs> but anyway, Donna Leon, I recommend all. I've read about five of the books back to back. I never do do that, but yeah, as soon as I finish one, I look for another one. Yeah, right. Middle March by George Eliot, who is... Well, uh, this is very one. different. Uh, yeah. I had never read any George Eliot until about uh, two or three years ago. And um, uh, it's I read a, a moderate amount of Dickens. I read some Jane Austen when I was at school because it was a set book, I think. Um, uh, but I'd never read any George Eliot. And George Eliot... Uh, as as you know, it was a woman, uh, yeah. but writing at a time when you know it, it just wasn't done for women to publish books under their own name. Well, it, well, it, it was, but, you know, yeah. obviously the Brontes wrote under their own name. But uh, I, this is a, a, quite a chunky novel, uh, may, maybe her most famous one. I don't know. Um, about a group of people that would generally not interest me in the slightest. I.e., it's a small town in the Midlands, I think she was from the Midlands, small yeah. town in the Midlands, and the people who live there in this town and the villages around it, etc., etc. But it's just her descriptions of the relationships between them are just so superb. I, um, I, um, I told you that I follow this blogger, uh, Richard Smith, who's got a, a blog called Richard Smith's Non-Medical Blog, uh, because yeah. he, he was a medic. Um, and and so he's he's a lover of books and he once said into one of his blogs he said what which are the books that i would read again and again and middlemarch was at the top of his list and i'm not mm -hmm. surprised although she was writing about people at a time that doesn't interest me that much and a type of people that int don't interest me so much because i i'm a city boy really um yes. it was just uh the the um the description of the people some of whom are nasty people, some of whom are very nice people. And uh, her heroine in this uh, is, is uh, just such a memorable character. Normally, normally villains are more memorable. But this heroine uh, in Middlemarch is just so memorable. And, and I remember her closing phrase was something like this. She says, you know, um, that this woman, she said, she never did anything very exciting or very memorable. Uh, and... She said something like this. She said, the fact that uh, life for you and me is not as bad as it could. I'm just I'm, I'm summarizing it. the fact that life for you and me is not as bad as it might be is partly due to the unremarked activities or acts 
of people like this who now rest in unmarked graves or something like that. Mm -hmm. So basically she was talking about the fact that, you know, just ordinary people doing, you know, being kind to each other and, and yeah. being well-meaning was, was worthwhile and all the rest. Oh, terrific, terrific book. You know, if I, I will, I'll read it again for sure. Two or three times. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, I don't think I've actually read it. I mean, I had a little spell probably 10, I don't know, probably 15 years ago when I went through trying to read as many of the classic books as I could because I felt like an ignoramus because I hadn't read Jane Austen and the like. Tim, Tim, I, I feel the same. I felt yeah. I'd, got to, I'd got to read more classics. And for example, it's not on my list. Oh, did I? Yes, it, maybe it is. Vanity Fair. Yes, yes it's a, right. it, it might be coming very soon. <laughs> in the next um, few seconds, possibly. But yeah, no, I mean, I went through. But this was one that I didn't get around to reading. And I don't know if I read Vanity Fair either. But they're yeah, actually, true. the reason they're classics is a lot of them are really, really good. I mean, that's what people don't yes, say. Exactly. Anyway, we've slightly spoiled the next book, but shall we go on to the next book? Let's go on to the next book. Which is Vanity Fair. So, yes. well, why Vanity Fair? I was in a, uh, I was in a classic uh, zone at the time, and so Vanity Fair was the next logical one. I'd never read it before, and again, yeah. it's about uh, it's about people in a in a type of society that I'm not familiar with, but they were they're so well drawn, and I remember one scene in particular. And that is um, some of the people uh, concerned are army officers. Uh, there's nobody from the lower ranks there. They're all officers. Um, yeah. And this happens just, it all happens just before Waterloo. So it's during the Napoleonic Wars. And um, and then, and, and they're all having parties and balls and all the rest of it. And then suddenly um, the army is posted to Belgium. Yeah. Uh, this is just before Waterloo. And, uh, and so all the lords and ladies who, who populate this um, book, Vanity Fair, um, they think, oh, what a great thing. This is going to be fun. We're going, we're going to go, we'll go along as well. And so, yeah, they pack up, you know, their traveling stuff and all the rest of it. And they get their, their staff to get their carriage ready. And they get their carriage onto a ferry, get across there. And they all turn up in Belgium. And they all move into these nice hotels in, in Brussels. And um, and then what happens is that suddenly they get they get word that Napoleon is advancing. You see, mm. and it told me something which I hadn't realised: how near Waterloo is to Brussels. It's only yeah. twenty kilometres south of Brussels. I mean, that's incredibly near. So anyway, so so the army, the actual army officers have to, have to say goodbye to their families and say sorry. We'll have to stop the balls and parties and what have you because we're going to have to go and do some fighting. Yeah. So off they go and, you know, no plot spoilers. Some of them survive and some don't. But the, the quote, the, the scene that I love best of all is these are people of what they would call the quality, i.e. the people, the upper echelons of society. Yeah. Anyway, um, they're all two days later, three days later, they're all unsure what was the outcome, what was the result of the, of the battle. And, um, and they're all getting very nervous about this because there's no clear news coming back. And so a lot of people um, left their hotels and went to the gates of the city waiting to hear news that coming back from the battlefield. And, um, <laughs> and he, he describes, Thackeray describes how uh, the situation was so stressful that some of the dukes and duchesses actually spoke to people they didn't know. <laughs> you know, yeah. Spoke to people they hadn't been introduced to, who very likely they were even foreigners. Yeah, yeah. So I yeah, know. he his his satire on, if you like, high society yeah. of that period is wonderful. Yeah. Well, apparently there was a. Uh, I mean, it's not quite, but I think like Crimea War, there was a lot of war. To, there was a big war tourism thing for a while. Yes. Yes. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I hadn't realized, when I read this book, I didn't realize it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, how great. That'll be fun. Yeah. Well, they, they used to have like, because I remember seeing some documentary. I'm going off topic here. We're going to totally ruin the show. But in the Crimea War, they had like 
people having a picnic while the battle was going on <laughs> like in the distance and they were just watching it the the same sort of high society people usually exactly well, you, well you, you know we've heard the phrase camp followers and yeah. i was familiar with the phrase but i i ne until i wrote this book i didn't realize that, that, that they really were followers who would come along you know move into hotels nearby and have parties yeah. and balls and what have you yes absolutely <laughs> yes. right I think we're going into the non-fiction bit, at least for a little while now. Uh... Adam Smith, What He Thought and Why It Matters by Jesse Norman. Well, uh, Adam Smith is often described as the father of economics. And yeah. it, I, it, economics is sometimes called the dismal science. And it's something that I, I realise that I don't know enough about because it underpins so much of, you know, what happens um, and politics and all the rest of it. And so uh, I thought I really need to, to learn something about Adam Smith. Now, I've got to say um, that I was so impressed. Jesse Norman, I vaguely knew the name. Uh, he's a conservative MP for Hereford, a, a, a small city that I know well and like yeah. very much. And he... Um, I suppose basically this, that this 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 fits in with maybe what he studied when he was at university and what have you. But um, his analysis of Adam Smith's life and the people he that he worked with and knew um, and well, it, the subtitle says it all. Really, yeah. um, it, it, I was blown away by his scholarship. I thought, well, I will, I, I won't. It won't stop me being critical of. To, current, uh, you know, present day politicians, but I will, I make an exception for every, anything I say about politicians, I'll exclude Jesse Norman. Um, yeah. It was just, uh, yeah, it, I, I don't, I don't pretend to understand it all, but I found it was such a, uh, it was such an important book, I think, and also, um, uh, so it was very, very well written. So Jesse Norman, hats off from me. So this is basically his interpretation of Adam Smith, and it's a biography of Adam Smith, really. Yes, it? it is, but it's more than that. It's an analysis yeah. of really of of the people oh. who came before him and came after him too. The, of yeah. the famous people. So, for example, Hume appears, uh, David Hume, and and then he talks obviously about lots of economists who followed on from Adam Smith and talked about the way that they differ from what he thought, but. Um, no, I thought that I, I, I think it's, a tr it's an important book. Uh, I'm going to go back and read it again, and hopefully next time I'll understand more of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I actually did economic. I did an economics degree when did you? Years, and years ago, like twenty or thirty years yeah. ago, interestingly. Um, and I did rem remember reading Adam Smith's thing, but yeah, I mean, economics is like, um, well. Economics is a very interesting subject, but it's a little bit undeveloped. It's a bit like I, I always say, people, it's a bit like medicine was in the 17th century. So there's a lot of drilling into people's skulls to relieve evil spirits. <laughs> and the like. So, but Adam Smith still, he's still a lot of his work is still very relevant now. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I listen to economics-based podcasts myself yeah. Tim so for example one of my favorite podcasts is by an Irish economist called David McWilliams who yeah. is terrific and uh, yeah uh, uh, not as dry as Adam Smith but yeah uh, good well I mean the trouble is like there's a lot of economists who are verge into political science people I mean yes um I mean I went I did economics at the London School of Economics but right. what people don't what people don't appreciate is the London School of Economics. It should be uh, called the. It's actually London School of Economics and Political Science. Yes, yes. So, and uh, it, it's like yeah, they, it's easy to end up shifting into the politics side, and I think too many yeah, economists yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, before we end up turning into the Venice and Economics podcast, we better go on to the <laughs> next one. All right. Black Gold, The History of How Coal Made Britain by Jeremy Paxman. Well, 
Paxman, of course, is a uh, well national treasurer, I suppose. Uh, although he's not he's not well at the moment. He has Parkinson's. Uh. Um, and by the way, he has a podcast, Tim. As you're a you're a high profile pod, podcaster, no. I'm a low profile podcaster. Well, he, I wouldn't say I'm high profile. But yeah. He has a podcast which he co-hosts with other uh, Parkinson sufferers. It's called Movers uh-huh. and Shakers, and yeah. Movers and Shakers, and they they record it in a pub in Notting Hill because they all live in London. Anyway, so Black Gold history, it, yes, it, right from the early days of the coal industry in this country. Um, he, uh, it is, it is beautifully written. I already know, I already knew what a good writer he is because I read, yeah. um, his book, The English, uh, which is, I, I, which I thought was a very good, uh, analysis of what, you know, what makes English people as distinct from Celts really, um, uh, different. Uh, and I also read Empire, which was then made into a TV series, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so I knew already that Jeremy Paxman, although you'd think of him as being a member of the establishment, but he's mm. not, he is far from an unthinking member of the establishment. And so, yeah, he challenges a lot of the, if you like, assumptions. For example, uh, he doesn't put his punches in descriptions of how tough life was for the, for the miners. Well, you know, well, when the coal industry was in its infancy and right up till when it basically collapsed, deep, deep, deep shaft mining pretty well collapsed after the 1980s, didn't it really? Um, yeah. I mean, he covers that whole history, writes it beautifully, some really, really nice, not re- nice is the wrong, wrong word, really, well-drawn stories of, of things that happened, things that went wrong. And he's he's pretty scathing about the people who, who made their living out of coal the easy way, namely owning a bit of bit of land that happened to have coal underneath it. In other mm. words, you were lucky enough to be a landowner that had coal deposits underneath. And and of course, yes, coal and steel, basically, those two industries made Britain really, and they and they made the British Empire possible. And um, uh, I, well, the, 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 there isn't a uh, there isn't a movement for Welsh independence these days. I don't think there's any ap- appetite for that. Um, but uh, it, back in the say in the early twentieth century, it, it almost might have been considered because obviously, uh, we- coal and steel coming from Wales uh, was just a massive, massive impact on the yeah. British economy. On the British economy, and so yeah, I thought it was a terrific book, start to finish. I, it was lent to me by a friend, and I've got it out ready to give it back to her when she asks for it back. But I, <laughs> I I'm hope hopefully I'll get a chance to read it again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds uh, sounds interesting. I mean, it's. Uh, I think with Parkinson's, it does it affects your body movements, doesn't it? It doesn't yes. make you mentally worse. It's not like That's, uh, hence outcome. the name, hence the name, movers and shakers. Right? Yeah. So they don't they don't pull their punches. There's about four or five of them, quite well known people, including I think a high court judge, uh, mm. a couple of other broadcasters, as well as as well as Paxman. Yeah, um, well, that's uh, good to know. All right, let's move on to the next. We're going back into the world of fiction, I think. And the next book is Fahrenheit four five one by Ray Bradbury. So. Well, I mean, I, I keep dipping into science fiction, um, uh, and and I know I should and will get into it more. And for example, Asimov, uh, etc. Yeah. But Fahrenheit four five one was the first uh, um, science fiction book that I read, and it's uh, and it uh, I wouldn't say it's believable, but. Um, uh, it, it, it's about a future time when um, when books were outlawed, and Fahrenheit four five one is the temperature at which paper will self ignite, um, basically. Yeah. So that's why it's called it. Yeah. So Fahrenheit uh, books were illegal, and um, if you were found to own any books, the odds are you'd be executed, and, and yeah. it's as, as if it were in. I think in this country, uh, although I think that's that's unclear. Um, yeah. No, no, what am I talking about? No, the US, more likely the US. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. 
And the bizarre thing about this Fahrenheit 451 is it, in this future time, the firemen, and there, there's a large fire department, and the firemen, the job of the firemen basically is to set fire to any books that are found. So anytime <laughs> that anybody um, shops their neighbor and says, oh, Mrs. So-and-so at number 23 has books, the fire department will come around there and they'll set fire to the books. And it's it seems like a very uh, bizarre uh, scenario, but it's it is so well written. It is it is yeah. it is beautifully written, um, and so uh, anybody who sort of said, well, I don't read I don't read science fiction. Well, this is science fiction, but it is it, it is a classic now. I don't know when it's. Uh, I'm trying to think when it was written. I'm I'm think I think probably first half of the twentieth century. I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I can probably uh, also Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Anybody who watches your show who is an author, and I bet there are lots, um, Ray Bradbury has said a lot of very interesting things about the craft of writing. Yeah, so, yeah, quite a lot of his of his quotations have found the way into my book, uh, Bread of <laughs> Soul of Wit. Yeah, well, I, I looked it up, it's 1953. It was oh, so I was, yeah, was you're almost right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, my mind, I was thinking 70s, but no, you're right, it was 1953. Right, shall we go into the next book, which is another famous fiction book. Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. Or Vonnegut. Well, yeah, yes, Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut, American, yeah. was uh, fought in World War Two. He was he was captured and he was imprisoned in Dresden. Yeah. Of course, Dresden is famous for the uh, effect of the fire bombing by, um, by the RAF and the US Army Air Force. And, um, and, so, uh, and so he observed that from the ground, basically. I and mean, he survived it. He survived it. And Vonnegut, by the way, is a, is a fascinating character. And so... Uh, Every now and then, if you're on social media, which I am to my shame, well, because there are a lot of good good jokes there. Yeah. Um, uh, every now and then, you'll see something really, really wise and witty that comes from Vonnegut. For example, the one I just saw most recently was um, uh, the meaning of real fear is the day you wake up and discover that your high school class are now running the country. Yeah. Anyway, Kurt Vonnegut, so he based this book on his experiences there. And uh, that's all I want to say. It is uh, it is a powerful, powerful book, Slaughterhouse Five. And I think because that's what Slaughterhouse Five, it, obviously he was being um, imprisoned in the place. It was obviously an abattoir. Yeah. And these different buildings were called Slaughterhouse One, Two, Three, Four, Five, etc. Um, and yeah. Just coincidentally, that's what, but it but it makes for a very dramatic title, doesn't it? Yeah. Because meanwhile, yeah. He, he although he was imprisoned in a slaughterhouse, there was a lot of slaughter going on above ground. Yeah. Okay. Shall we go? Let's head on to the next book. The Cold Millions by Jess Walter. Jess Walter. I had never heard of this guy um, until. About six months ago, I was in my local library here in Birmingham, and I saw yeah. that, and for some reason, the title got to me. It was a cold day, and um, and I thought, the cold millions. And when you thought, yeah, actually, yes, people, you know, uh, particularly in, uh, in in places in in the in the northern parts of the U.S. and in in most parts of the U.K., we spend a lot of the year. Sh shivering, don't we, and wondering if we've yeah. got enough warm clothes to keep us warm. Well, if you're sh if you're very short of money, which is the, obviously the meaning of the the, the, the phrase "the millions," um, then that is a major major issue for you. How are you going to keep warm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, and so I picked it up because of the title. I'd never heard of him, but I thought he was a terrific author. I'm gonna I, I'm gonna find some more stuff by him, and it's basically. 
again, it's it's sort of historical fiction in that one or two of the characters actually did live. So there's an oh. actual real life person who was a labor organizer activist uh, who appears in the plot and she actually did live. Um, and so it describes things she could very well have done. But most of the characters are fictional and it's a is a it's a beautifully written and I think well plotted book because it it all takes place in um in and around the city of Spokane, which um, is in Washington State, yeah. you know, left hand side you might say. Yeah, it's not, yeah, not yeah. as far west as Seattle, but it's it's probably the second biggest city in, in Washington State. Yeah. And and you and it's set at a time when really it was uh well it wasn't the wild west but it was pretty close to it yeah you know it was fairly lawless place it was a, there yeah, there was a police force and quite a big one but they were launched themselves so shall we say they yeah. did pretty well what they wanted a yeah. woe betide you if you were for example a vagrant yeah which you, a lot of the characters are in this book are vagrants. Uh, you know, they be the, the hobos, whatever you, vagrants we have to call them, who who've made their way. You know, jumping a freight train and that kind of thing. Mm. And they get to Spokane, thinking, "Oh, we're in a city. Oh, things are improving now." Uh, well, well, they do for a, a short while until they come across the local police, who are pretty tough. <laughs> anyway, the Cold yeah. Millions, Jess Walter. I thought it was a terrific book. Yeah, I mean, I've. I never got to Spokane. I almost went there uh, when I was trying to visit all 50 US states, but in the end, I went to Seattle instead. You have been around, haven't you? I noticed some of your travels on, on Facebook there, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I went to I, Seattle. I probably would never have been there, but it just so happens that I have two two dear friends of mine who I've known, a, a, a guy that I was at school with and his wife live in a place on the Canadian side of the border, not that far from Spokane, they live in a they live in a town called Trail. Wonderful. Oh. And Trail is just north of the border, and so the nearest big city actually for them, although it trails in Canada, um, the nearest big city for them is Spokane. Oh, okay. Anyway, right. let's not go into the Canada border crossing podcast. <laughs> let's yeah. go on to your next book, which I think is fiction still, but we'll find out in a second. Progress and Poverty by Henry George. So, oh. Well, I mentioned to you that I listened to s several podcasts that are about uh, economics and finance yeah. and all the rest of it sort of thing. Uh, one of my favourites is a guy called David McWilliams. I'd heard of him because uh, he featured in a book by Michael Lewis, now, Michael Lewis, I'm sure you're familiar with him. He's probably one of the best-selling non-fiction writers on the planet. Yeah. And, you know, three of his books have been turned into, into films, haven't they? Uh, yeah. Big Short, um, uh, Liars, Poker. Uh, not Liars Poker, um, uh, um, Moneyball, yeah. and The Blind Side, all been turned into, into, into uh, films. And in one of his books, David Lewis, he, he travelled around the various countries in Europe in particular that have been yeah. affected by the global financial meltdown in 07, 08, 09. Yeah. And one of them, he, one of the places he went was Ireland, which at that time was in a bit of a mess. Uh, it's not anymore. Uh, uh, and, uh, and if you listen to David Williams podcast, he'll tell you, he'll tell you that Ireland's economy is a much better shape than the yeah. British one, but that's by the by. Uh, he happened to mention in that book, Michael Lewis, that, there was this guy called David McWilliams who seemed to have the ear of the people in power in the government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when I saw that this guy had a podcast uh, and he was an economist, I thought, "Oh, I've got to check him out." And mm. you know, just like with a writer, generally speaking, I make my decisions about a book if I like it or don't like it. And, I'll pick up a book in the library and I'll read maybe a chapter or maybe two, and I might decide, "No, this is not for me." And I don't take it out. And that's very often based on the style. Yeah. Well, particularly with David Williams, I just like his style. He's very humorous, very relaxed, swears a fair bit too. Um, and anyway, so to get to the point, in yeah. one of his episodes, and I listen to him every week, one or maybe one or two episodes a week, 
and it's just called the Dave McWilliams podcast. And he he happened to to interview somebody um, because he's got connections all over the world. And he'd yeah. say, oh, let's go to Seattle or let's go to Tokyo, whatever it is. And he'll interview somebody he knows. And he, and he, by the way, and this is interesting for you, Tim, as you studied economics, he is very much central in organizing an annual conference called Kilconomics. It's wow. called that it's in Kilkenny in yeah. Ireland. And, um, and, and he, he said the speakers are... Or they're either economists or comedians, he says, and it's hard to tell the difference between them. So anyway, he, <laughs> yeah. uh, he's, he talked about in one of his episodes a book called Progress and Poverty, this yeah. one here by Henry George. It was written by, I think, maybe a self-taught economist, Henry George, and the book became the best-selling, best-known book in America after the Bible, and of course the Bible is more widely read in America than it is here. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. at, the end, at the end of the 19th century, um, this book um, became such a bestseller um, and it came out with some, some theories which have been controversial ever since. And McWilliam said that basically the theories that Henry George came up with, he said, no economist of the right or the left can ever find an argument against it, but unfortunately, thanks to something called vested interests, yeah. nothing will change. And basically, what Henry George said was, progress and poverty, the two are linked, that he says, economic progress, and uh, very often we measure that, don't we, on, you know, increase in GDP yeah. per annum, etc., or GDP per capita, whatever it is, he says that almost always economic progress uh, and a country getting richer always leads to more inequality yeah. so progress and poverty and then so the book is about that and it, and then he comes up with his own theories about how you can change that and what he and the bit that was controversial was that he had this theory that taxation should be based on land and not on work in other words that 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 uh, yeah. taxation would move, should move away from uh, away from taxing people's work towards t taxing land because that because ownership of land or not ownership of land mm. ownership of property or not uh, was the biggest bar to advancement uh, and so yeah uh, a bit like a, a, an echo of uh, the Paxman book uh, uh, Black Gold if you were lucky enough to own a bit of land that had a coal deposit underneath it your family was made for life basically yeah yeah no it's a bit um i just want to uh, thank somebody in the comments uh jafar fald who said he shared this great live stream on linkedin so i don't, don't know yes. if he has or not but i'll find out when not after the show so thank you anyway and, uh, and henry george henry george listen um he gave his name to a movement called georgism so if you, oh. if, you if you type georgism into into google um you'll you'll find him referred to and you know what uh, after this this podcast a couple of months later i was go i went to a meeting in bristol where i was living yeah. at the time um and it was run by um a local indie uh, newspaper called bristol 24 7 i think yeah. um and uh, and the, the it was about public transport uh attitudes to public transport uh, which which in bristol by the way is famously shambolic it's an absolute mess anyway, that's by the by so we had there was this conference there and uh and this seminar and at various times they 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 got us onto little tables and you know, discuss this point in between you and then we'll get together etc et anyway i got talking to this person who was at my table a total stranger and um and we we were talking about you know what books we'd read recently and i happened to say well i'm reading in a book called progress and poverty and she said Un unprompted she said henry george georgism i said wow i said i've never met anyone before that had heard of this and and i've only just heard about it on a podcast and she said well the reason is that my grandmother was a rather grand lady in london in about in the year about the year uh, 1900 she said or my great grandmother whatever it was and she had a salon because she was had a lot of connections like you know, you, you know the sort of people we, we all we've all got connections. You see, my great my great grandmother had a she knew all sorts of people. For example, she would invite George Bernard Shaw mm. 
to for drinks at her place. And so she said, yes, uh, George Purdy Shaw came, Henry George came. So yeah, I thought, wow, how bizarre is this to meet somebody randomly whose great grandmother knew Henry George and, I, and I'd only heard of him two weeks yeah. beforehand. Yeah. I mean, I think the, uh, the funny thing is that like, he's obviously dead right about land tax. But I know from it's basically land is the only real form of wealth that you can easily tax. Yes. And um, they, they keep talking about wealth taxes, but wealth taxes always end up as a disaster because you end up people squabbling about how much somebody is actually worth and like all the rest of it. But land is a lot easier to tax because you buy uh, exactly. the land or you have I agree. I agree totally. And um, and then David Williams in his podcast went on and said that a lot of the problem in Ireland, particularly, say, OK, yeah. let's take it away from the UK. Ireland, he said, is one of the least populated countries in Europe after Norway. And yet it has the uh, average property price was one of the highest. It's almost up there with UK. Um, and he said a lot of the reason for that is land banking or land hoarding. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you see, it's it's what McWilliams calls the, the lazy man's way to make money. You, you know, you buy some land and you sit on it for 20 years. Yeah. Anyway, before we turn into the land tax podcast, I suppose we should go <laughs> to this book, which may steer us back in the Venice podcast thing. Uh, let me just say. Yeah. So, Venice for Pleasure by uh, uh, J.G. Uh, Links. JG Links. I uh, first time I went to Venice, um, I, I mentioned to you that I went there for my honeymoon. But I also five years before that, I went with a pal of mine who was and is a big fan of everything Italian, and yeah. uh, and we went there, and and I was lucky in that. Well, we were lucky in that we drove. Basically, I had at the time I had an Alfa uh, Tim because I was really into Italian cars, and so I thought, well, it's logical enough to take my Alfa to, to to Italy. So we drove there, and if you look at the map of Venice, there's this place. Th there's this spit of land where there's a seaside resort called Lido di Jesolo, um to the on the east side that separates the lagoon, the Venice lagoon from the Adriatic Sea. Yeah. And if you drive down as far as you can go to the very end there, it's a place called Pan Punta Sabioni. And from there, you can park your car. There's a campsite there that we stayed on. Park your car and you can get on a boat, a Vaporetto, a big one, yeah. will take you right into Venice. So what that means is that your first view of Venice is that famous view that, that Canaletto painted and, yeah. and painted. And so, Oh, that's a, talk about a Kodak moment. That was unbelievable. So, anyway, why did I get this? Why do I like this book? Well, I I bought this book from the or got it from the library, and two things about it that I love. Um, in the introduction, JG Link says most walking tours of Venice end in a church or a art gallery. My tours of Venice don't. They end in a bar facing the church or the art gallery where yeah. you'll have a drink uh, and then you'll decide whether you're going to go into the gallery or church or have another drink. And I thought, mm. I like this man already. So in other words, he didn't take his uh, his treatment of history, which obviously Venice is, is full of, you yeah. know, being such an important city as it was. Um, he doesn't take his history too seriously. And the other thing that I loved was uh, his 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 one line. He said, "He said I once met a man who said that Venice disappointed him. How I envy that man his powers of imagination." <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you've been yeah. there recently. Uh, I bet you would agree. Oh yeah, no, it's definitely. Uh, I mean, it's definitely somewhere I will go back to. I think because there was a lot I didn't see. I mean, I think you can't really. I was there for like three days, I think, no, and no. I was very jet lagged because um, there's a whole another story. I don't want to change this into the travel Tim's okay. travel podcast. <laughs> I have actually got a YouTube channel which I need to do some videos for, so I yeah. might. Do, but, um, but yeah, I got a really cheap business class fare, but it started in Venice, so oh, right. I had to fly up to Venice, stay overnight. I found this little thing near airport, fly to the US. Then come back and go to Venice. So I thought, well, I'll stay three days in Venice when I'm there. So, wow, what a great idea! Well, I mean, it's 
it's a it's a weird fact, but it's considerable. It can be up to half the price of a business class fare across the Atlantic if you fly from anywhere else in Europe as opposed anywhere to else except, anywhere else except rip off Britain. Uh, there was a time, Kim, and I bet you know this, where when you could fly uh, up to Iceland and get a flight from Iceland to mm. East Coast USA for half the price of everywhere else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you can still do that to some extent. But mm -hmm. um, no, it's because this air, well, part of it's air passenger duty to impact back to tax again. Yeah. But it's like once you, I mean, funny, once you get up to premium economy, it suddenly jumps up to like 200 quid air tax. You have to pay. Oh, really? Point. So oh. anyway, so um, it, this is kind of, is this, this is like a, is this an illustrated guide or is this, is this only available? Yeah, it, it's so, uh, I mean, I got it out for my first trip to Venice, which was yeah. 40 years ago, um, maybe more. And um, it was, no, it was more because before I was married, actually. Yeah. Uh, and so it was 50 years ago. Um, and I haven't seen it since. So, but, but it was such a beautifully written book. And just those two phrases for me yeah. sum up JG Links. And so anytime anybody's going to Venice, that's the book I recommend. Yeah, well, it's still available on Amazon, though I'm not sure if it's one of these resale sure. ones. So it's, might be like I, I'm almost grand. certain it's got it's got photographs and it's got maps. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's get on to some this interesting new new up and coming author I've been hearing. The Wedding Speech Handbook by Michael J. McMahon. So this is you, isn't it? This is me exactly. Well, um, I yes. So. Uh, one of the things I did was I worked in the chemical industry for most of my career. Um, yeah. And then towards the end of that, um, the company I worked for, which was a Swedish group, uh, I've been working for them for 20 odd years, but and running the UK company. Um, then the group was taken over by a Norwegian group. And so um, I thought, well, OK, um, I'm going to have to uh, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to leave. I want to be ever so helpful to these Norwegian people because I'm hoping that they'll make me a make me an offer I can't refuse to go re to take redundancy. So uh, for quite a while, I commuted to Norway uh, first thing on a Monday morning and back on the first on the last flight on Friday night, helping them with the merger process and various other things. Anyway, cut a long story sideways. Um, they asked me to start running some courses for them. And they said, look, you know, because you know our business well, because they were competitors of ours, basically. Yeah. So I, I knew their business um, because it was the same as our, as the business I've been involved in for years. And he said, you know our business well. And um, so we'd like you to design and run some training courses. And so I ran these courses. And, and the one that did best was a, a presentations course. Because yeah. they said, look, all our people have been taught English well in schools. And yes, they were right. I mean, their grasp of English grammar was better than most Brits, I've got to say. Yeah. And Norwegians, Swedes, Danes, it's all the same. They're, they're taught very well. But what they said was a, a lot of them lacked the confidence to speak it well, you know, in business situations. So will you run some courses? So I did that. And I did it in collaboration with a Norwegian management consultant, uh, and it went very, very well. Anyway, so did these ran these courses for for several years, and eventually it got to the point where um, they um, I, I trained everyone in the company that needed training, really. Um, yeah. So, but but the point I wanted to make was, having done this, I suddenly realised, okay, I'm I'm training people here who need better English for their jobs and they need to be able to present in public for their jobs. But they're okay at doing this, but they need to get a bit better. And if they get it wrong this month, they can say, oh, well, okay, next time or yeah. next month, it'll be better because I'll learn a bit more, etc." Cetera, et cetera. Whereas a wedding, and yeah. obviously I've been to a fair, fair few weddings in my time and probably you have too, uh, at a wedding, it's a one-off. Well, at least we hope mm. it is. Um, it's a one-off, so you don't get a chance to, you know, polish your skills next week or next month or whatever. Um, and it's emotional, it's personal. So I thought that makes it tough. Plus, my own elder daughter was about to get married, um, and I thought, ah, the whole 
thing about wedding speeches. It's worth writing a book about that. So what I did was I really applied what I'd learned about presentations, presentation yeah. skills, public speaking, et cetera, et cetera, and managing the nerves of it, uh, uh, try to apply that to weddings. So hence that book. Yeah. So um, what are some of your wedding se speech handbook secrets then? That you can reveal? Oh, well. What, what is, like, if somebody is worried about nerves, they're like, very nervous, what, yes. what well, well, advice would you be? But the first thing to say is start the planning early because, quite, yeah. because most most weddings there's a lot very long lead time. You know, yeah. I occasionally go to wedding fairs, Tim, to promote my book, yeah. um, and I'll meet people. You know, they'll, couples will come around and have a chat, and I'll say, "So when when is the big day for you?" And quite often they'll say, "Oh, it's next summer, or it's the summer, mm -hmm. or it's the summer after that." They'll say, "Oh, middle of 2025." So. There's a long lead time. So the people who are going to speak at a wedding, they know it, they know it in advance, a long time. Yeah. But generally speaking, they don't start planning it until a week or two beforehand. And yeah. that's the worst thing you could do because if they've got any sense, they know that this could be they this could be a nerve-wracking occasion. So the sooner you start planning it, the better. That because that takes a, a bit of the stress away to think, okay, right, I think I know what roughly what I'm gonna say and I polish it, etc. So that's number what my number one tip would be start the planning early. At least work out a skeleton of what you're gonna say. Yeah. Number two, nerves are inevitable. The nerves are inevitable. You'll never get you'll never get rid of them. I my mantra is if you're not nervous before speaking at a wedding, you're not normal. And yeah. so, somewhere around you said to me, or oh, oh, you're a psychopath. Yeah, <laughs> so you're bound to be nervous. So yeah. the, the, the trick is, how can you manage the nerves so that you can actually live with them? Because the, the adrenaline is what gives you the energy to give a good speech. Yeah. But you've got to get the adrenaline under control. And so I teach people while I'm coaching them uh, two or three different ways, because we're all different. And so what works for one person doesn't work for another. Yeah. I teach some different ways of managing those nerves um, and give them some little tools that they can use uh, in the time before the wedding and also um, at the, at, on, the, on the day. And the third thing I say is, although, although this is Britain and we're famous for uh, being comedians and and always very witty and all the rest of it, you don't have to be funny. Um, yeah. There's a lot of pressure on people who think, oh, I've got to tell jokes. And, uh, and I say, you don't have to tell jokes. Tell stories, yes. Yeah. Tell stories to just show the fact that, you know, that, that, that you know the people well who are getting married. One of them might be you. Um, yeah. And um, uh, tell stories about the occasion and about the people, etc., etc. If you're a gifted joke teller, fine to tell a joke. But for God's sake, don't tell a joke that you found on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Would you be surprised how many people do that? Yeah. It's like, it's, um, they're, they're, well, I think we've all seen amusingly bad uh, wedding speeches over the years. Yes. <laughs> anyway. Let's go on to the, the next book, also by the same brilliant author. Brevity, the soul of wit, a miscellany, miscellany of mottos and maxims, an encyclopedia of epigrams by Michael J. McMahon. So that was quite hard to say. So uh, why, why did you, well, I know why you wrote this book, but why did you write this book? <laughs> Well, um, the I, I mentioned the fact that I did those courses in Norway with a yeah. Norwegian management consultant. Now, she spoke very good English, and she soon discovered that I have a photographic memory for uh, quotations, epigrams, maxims, um, and, and so I would quite often come out with one that I liked. And she said to me, you're very good at these. She said, you ought to publish a book of them. And you mm -hmm. know what she said? Your friends would send them in to you. Anyway, I did nothing about it for several years, and eventually I decided, okay, I would put a book together. So I put together a book. Well, it's now the first, there's two in a series, and there will be more. And yeah. I've also got a YouTube channel called The Mottoist. Uh, and oh. so, yeah, it's just that sharing my love of these little things that say a lot, say a lot in just a few words. Um, and, and so 
the, the quotations, and there are loads of them, they divide it up into little categories. So, for example, there'll be, there'll be a section on travel, uh, you know, called trains and boats and planes. There'll be one yeah. about relationships between men and women called Battle of the Sexes and stuff like that. And then uh, in, in every case, I name the person who first said it as far as I know. Yeah. You know, very often, or very often, these things are disputed. And I also, in many, many cases, I put my own little comment on it, my own twist as to why I like that. Yeah. So is it kind of, is it all quotations or is it kind of? Yes. Well, uh, quotations, what? mottos, maxims, epigrams, whatever you like to call them. So obviously, yeah. People like Oscar Wilde feature in there, um, uh, uh, George Bernard Dor Shaw. Dorothy in there. Parker. <laughs> Sorry? Dorothy Parker. He was oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, Churchill. Uh, but also people who are not famous. For example, yeah. um, if uh, something that my dad used to say, uh, he used to say, a pleasure delayed is a pleasure doubled, which I thought was terrific. Um, yeah. And... And I was never able to find out who said it. So, therefore, it's in my book, it's credited to my dad. Yeah. Now, I, I do remember reading books of quotes and famous quotes and enjoying them. So, but yeah, they always used to say famous quotes or quotes from famous people. But I suppose you're you're just using expressions from anybody. So, it's not necessarily for anybody. Famous. Yeah. There's some, most of them are famous people, but, yeah. but many of them are not famous quotations. Yeah. Um, and, and here's the thing. Uh, uh, they, um, I already owned several, uh, if you like, encyclopedias of quotations because people yeah. used to give me these things because they knew I liked them. And yeah. so I, I already had maybe 10 of these types of books on my bookshelf. But I thought, OK, they're there. And quite often they were edited or curated by famous people. But what they never did was That's comment funny. on them. Yeah. I mean, OK, if they were jokes, there's no point commenting. Yeah. Um, because and here's my and here's my favourite quote about explaining jokes. It says, uh, and this was, I can't remember who said it now, um, but it'll come back to me. Um, explaining a joke is like dis dissecting a frog. Uh, nobody is interested, and the frog dies anyway. So anyway, <laughs> if it's a joke, there's no point explaining it. But yeah. very often. Um, or for example, I might, if it was something that I thought was a very wise saying. I, I might say why I found it particularly powerful. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that actually makes a difference. I think, I mean, it's like, there's so many. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, you could always say that you could quote Winston Churchill or Mark Twain, or all the people who are misattributed yes. quotes all the time. Yes. Uh, it's usually, it's Churchill, Mark Twain, Churchill. There's a few other people, Abraham Lincoln. Oscar Wilde, yes, right. you Shaw, exactly, yeah. that's right. And quite often, you can't be sure whether it was Wilde or Churchill or Shaw said it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Yeah. well, it's like, or um, I can't remember, it might be me that made this up, but I think somebody else did where they were saying, you can't believe anything you hear on the internet, Abraham Lincoln. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's one of my favourites too. Yeah. And I said to you, I, I waste more time on Facebook and LinkedIn than I should. And yeah. with Facebook, most of the reason is because I get great jokes there. Yeah. And cartoons, yeah. the far side cartoons by Gary Larson. Yeah. Right. So ooh, let me play my little transition. Um, I ask... I used to ask my guests quite a few questions at the end, uh, but I'm going to ask you just two questions this time. If you had to give somebody one of the books from this list, yes. um, what would be your logic for working out which book to give them? Um, I, I used to say originally, like, which book would you give them? But no, what's your process for working out which of these 15 books you would give somebody? Well, um, well, first of all, it would be thinking about the person concerned. Yeah. And, um, for example, most blokes that I know don't read fiction. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the reading group, uh, book groups that exist in this country, 70, 80 percent of them are women only. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, and if you ask the women why do we uh, why don't you have men in your group they would say well our, our partners and our husbands don't read fiction 
and, yeah. we like, and we like reading fiction. So, so it would depend, for example, if it was a man or a woman, first of all. And secondly, the, the, the sort of character, I would think, okay, uh, there's, I, I, th I think, I hope there's a wide variety here. So, for example, um, Middlemarch, I think, of the classics that I have, because I, I got into a phase of reading classics yeah. two or three years ago, not having read any for a long, long time. Um, and, you know, to a greater extent than Dickens or Trollope or Jane Austen, uh, George, uh, um, sorry, George Eliot <laughs> uh, uh, just blew me away. I thought yeah. she's terrific. I read three or four of her books now. So, yeah, but, but, but it, it, it's not for everybody. OK, so um, I would, for example, um, I would recommend Don and Leon, the, the the book about the the, the thrillers set in Venice. Yeah. I recommend them to just about anyone because mm. um, they're just they're very accessible but beautifully beautifully written. You've just got to look at the at the puffs, so called. You know the um, the recommendations on the cover mm. of those books to see she she is considered a a quality novelist by people who know and yet her books are very accessible and 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 they're set in my favorite city so yeah. that's that um uh, of of the non-fiction books well of course uh, the zone of interest having been made into a film lately that yeah. or, or the or basis for a film anyway really uh that gives its uh, extra interest to someone who is interested in 20th century history, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, And, uh, and again, uh, the right sort of person, John le Carre uh, is, uh, I would consider a very high quality uh, thriller writer, um, obviously famous for his spy novels, but, but um, a word, a murder of quality, I'd recommend to anyone because it's nothing to do with spies. Yeah. It's about a, a school and the relationships in the school and the murder that happens there. But it's very interesting what you learn about his attitude to private schools yeah. from this book. So uh, there are lots. It would, it would depend on the person. It would depend on the person. Okay. And the other question, which I suppose I don't ask everybody because it's kind of ultra related, but what books have you got coming up? What, what books are you writing uh, well, um, in the future. I, um, I've had a project on the go for quite a while and every now and then I make progress with it and then stop. And it's really to take this, um, the themes that I talk about in the wedding speech book, uh, yeah. probably the most important part of the book is how you deal with the nerves. Because you can't yeah. avoid, it. you know, you you're, yeah. you're bound to be nervous in that situation. And the question is, how do you manage them? So, um, therefore, the whole issue of self confidence, which is very uh, what I call context specific, you know, you could be very confident at this and that, yeah. but yeah. but not confident at the other thing. Um, so, uh, how do you manage to, if you like, cut and paste the confidence you've got in one thing? to something else. So that's confidence. Yeah. But there's something that underpins it, which is different and is, and, and confidence, by the way, is is context specific and it's also ephemeral. It's sort of, you know, yeah. it comes and goes, it comes and goes, you know. Yeah. I might, I might, I say, I've been speaking in public for 50, more than 50 years, but there'll be a time when I'm not feeling good about giving a speech or mm. I might be just too relaxed and be rubbish. So yeah. that's that's confidence that comes and goes, but underpinning it all is self-esteem, and yeah. so therefore, what I want, what I'm trying to do is put together a book that, if you like, links the two, and uh, whether it, whether it's the basis for a book that's got anything to it, I don't know. So that's one thing, um, and uh, and the other thing is the next volume in this book of quotations. Yeah. Um, so uh, because I've already got enough for a second book because I was working on it about two years ago and then stopped to write the book of quotations for writers. So yeah. that volume two of the more general one, that's probably the next book because that, that can come out pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, sounds like you've, you, you're on the way to having your publishing empire. Uh, <laughs> set up. Uh, pretty small yeah. Empire. <laughs> yeah. And then you can move to Venice. So, <laughs> so 
it's been great to have you on the show today and this is where i'm which button do i press first do i press the first i think i'm pressing the button on here so goodbye thank to you for inviting me yeah. thanks for inviting me thank you for thank you for listening yeah and uh thanks for so much for being on the show